Mary Magdalene interviews Jesus on the subject of Mormon religion. Questions from Caroline Brock. This is session three. The interview took place in Kentucky, New South Wales, Australia, on the 25th of September, 2012. Okay. Um, hi everyone. Today is the third in a series of interviews about Mormonism that was started by Carolyn Brock, who is a Mormon who lives in the United States. And so I'm going to be continuing on with asking some of her questions of Jesus today. Um, so Caroline has sent me the questions and I'll be asking them in first person mm -hmm. as if I'm Caroline. Mm -hmm. If I go ahead and ask some of my own questions, I'll, I'll own them as my own and introduce them that way. So, so do we get the accent change as well? <laughs> like American no. accent, Australian accent? No, no. I wouldn't do that to Caroline. <laughs> no <worries. laughs> um, I don't think I could do her justice. <laughs> um, and then following this interview, we'll likely do some mediumship with mm. spirits mm. with mormon spirits because there's a number of them around who are wanting to speak yeah they've been around us for well ever since the first interview we did with caroline actually so since that interview they've been wanting to discuss the matters with us so we thought we'd give them an opportunity after after these interviews have been completed yeah mm. okay so ready yes i'm ready <laughs> <Fire away. All> right. <laughs> Um, in the family, a proclamation to the world, our prophet and 12 apostles state that marriage between a man and a woman is ordained of God and that the family is central to the creator's plan for eternal destiny of his children. Mm. Mormons believe that families are forever and that our children are sealed to us in temples for eternity. Because of this, we feel that since a homosexual union cannot produce children, it must go against the very core of what God has set forth as the proper pattern in the Bible and in the eternities. Mm. Perhaps if we can, before she answers, ask the question about this particular issue, if we can address the underlying concept that the family is something that is of primary importance to our life here on earth. And um, this, this is the beginning of the era, if you like. Um, if you, if you think about it from God's perspective, God has already created the human soul and the human soul exists before it comes and incarnates into a body. So the reality is we are not creating the individual person who, who, who is the baby, but we are creating rather the receptacles for the baby to use or the child to use and grow up with, both in the physical and the spirit realms. So all we're doing as earth-based parents is we have this opportunity to be involved in the creation of a body. And any time a male and a female get together, they have the ability to create the bodies, both bodies, the physical body and the spirit body. But that's all they're doing. A lot of people believe that is a very significant thing. And while the process itself is significant in the sense that it creates bodies that can remain alive, those bodies would not remain alive without the connection to a soul that has incarnated and now uses those particular bodies to experience their life. So it's not the human couple who have, who have created the soul of the individual. Mm -hmm. They have only attracted the soul of a particular individual by the creation, by the sex act, creating the two bodies for that soul to incarnate into. That being the case, the two, uh, the, 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 the couple are not really the parents of, the, of that particular child. God is already the parent of that child and the child has a unique personality independent of whatever parents it, it actually incarnated into. Its personality has already been defined and created by God and therefore the individual child is really an entity in its own right before it even has the bodies in which it can connect to to exist in the physical realm and the spirit realm. So this whole concept that a child is my child, the concept of ownership is, is deeply flawed. The reality is the child is God's child 
and you've just created the physical and spirit bodies for that child to have an incarnated existence here on the planet for a short or long period of time depending on what choices are made. Now it could potentially be a long period of time, they might live to a ripe old age as the saying goes of 80 or 90, I don't know if that's such a ripe age, but um, they also may have a very short existence and accidents or sickness befalls them, but the process of incarnation has been complete and we have been involved in that process of incarnation, but that, that doesn't mean that we actually own the child. We are not the owners of the child. And therefore, the child is not our child, but rather God's child. And we are really only the creators of the bodies in which the child exists. So there you're speaking to this idea that Caroline has raised within the Mormon faith of children being sealed to parents. Yes. Um, the reality is that all children on the planet, whether they know it or not, are sealed to God not to their parents. Uh -huh. They are sealed to God in the sense that God created them. God created their very existence, created their personality, created their nature. And as a result of that, they, they, the child has, has a connection or the ability to have a connection with God. Also, because of the way incarnation works, the two halves of the soul split, uh, the soul splits into two halves at the time of incarnation. As a result of that, the only person really who one half of the soul is truly bound to for the rest of its existence is the other half of itself, not, not its parents. The parents in fact form a very minor role and the minor role is the creation of the bodies in which the child can actually have an incarnated existence on the physical earth and in the spirit world. Um. So this is now my question, mm -hmm. before we enter Caroline's questions. Um, it seems to me, though, now you're speaking to the idea of the family construct, and you're saying that a parent has no other role other than forming bodies? Well, not really. Like, the reality is a parent can form bodies and then have no interest in the child whatsoever after that point, and many parents on this planet currently are exactly like that. Yes. They are the parent of a child and they form no interest. Of course, the reality is what God would prefer us to do is to demonstrate some interest in these children in terms of, in terms of this cust custodian type relationship that we have with them. Mm -hmm. We are really their older brother or sister. And being such, we could teach them a lot of things that we have already learned and therefore um, cause them to uh, be able to avoid a lot of personal harm that may have come to them otherwise. The other thing that we need to bear in mind is that our role is really to help them get to know their true parent, God. And so our role would be to teach them God's laws through an experiential process. Uh, it's not a lecturing process where we dump all of our concepts and ideas upon the person, but rather we help them come to experience the universe and experience God through, process, through the process of their own engagement mm -hmm. with their relationship with God and their relationship with other people on the planet and the relationship with the complete environment, in fact. So we can teach them how to love. We can teach them how to be honest and truthful. But, and these are all gifts that we can give them as a parent. But we are not the true parent. We need to come to terms with that, that we are not their owner. We, we are not the person who has control over what they do with their life. We do not have a say about what they should or shouldn't do with their life because that is their own choice and decision. All we need to do is assist them in the process of ab being able to make wise decisions that are harmonious with the laws that God has already created. So the concept that I can own a child or own a person through, through this family ownership arrangement and therefore dictate to that child or person what they should do in their life is a very, very flawed concept. And it actually creates much harm and pain in the majority of children. The majority of children feel very confined through that particular ownership process. And in fact, many children grow up to do exactly what their parents want and, uh, and never ever expand out of that until they reach the spirit world because of that one concept that the family is more important than all other things. Mm -hmm. The reality is that each of us are brothers and sisters, so my love for you needs to be just as strong as my love for somebody that I've only just met because they are still my brother or sister. Mm -hmm. The reality is if we have love favourites, which is what the process of family co creates, we have favouritisms in love. This is what creates a lot of disharmony and, and inequality. 
on the mm. planet. And we need to st stop holding on to these very archaic notions that family and gene pool are everything to do with some kind of binding system. Now, that is a general statement of all of humanity, mm -hmm. but it does relate to Carolyn's question about the Mormon faith. Yeah, so maybe if we can just start on her questions, which sure. centre more around <clears throat> the issue of homosexuality. Sure. So the first question is, if homosexuality was a part of God's plan, then why can't homosexuals procreate on earth and have families? So this question, the, the seat of this question is all about procreation being the, the important fact. That is not the case. As I've just previously mentioned, any sperm can get with any egg cell and all of a sudden you have the creation of two bodies into which a child can incarnate. And in fact, mankind currently is doing that process uh, as a, as a, in, a, in a test tube or a, uh, or a petri dish. And, um, and of course, I don't know, like there's a lot that can be said about that, but, but the reality is that's how simple the process of creation of the two bodies is from a, from a, from a simple act. Yeah. The idea that that somehow then defines the adult who is the parent for the rest of their existence is a ludicrous notion. There are many, many people on this planet who have never had children, and there are many of those people who are heterosexual in nature that have never had children. Does that mean that they are no longer a person or they're no longer a valid, you know, that they don't understand things about love automatically because they don't have children? I, I can't agree with that. They are just as capable of understanding love and understanding truth and having a rich experience in their life, whether they have children or not. So, so the whole concept that procreation is God's primary purpose for marriage is also a, a, very, a very strange concept. If you examine the, sexual, the way we're made up sexually, a woman's body is capable of orgasms, in other words, capable of sexual pleasure, without any, any uh, penetration at all, and therefore without any process of creating a child. And so this is an indication that God's intention with the sex act wasn't to primarily be for the sake of procreation. Of course, it's a driving factor in procreation, but uh, it wouldn't be the only factor in procreation. And in fact, the sex act has been created by God for many other reasons besides procreation that are far more important, actually, than procreation to a large degree. Now, I'm not saying procreation is unimportant, because the reality is without it, we wouldn't have the continuance of a, of a race. But... But it is not as important in the definition of the parent or the child as people on the planet seem to believe. So is it significant then that um, homosexuals cannot conceive a child during the sex act? Well, I don't feel it's significant in any way. We know how a child is created. We know how a body is created. Uh, the two bodies I'm talking about, both the spirit and the material body, is created through the sex act of a male and a female. However, that does not mean that the sex of between two males or sex between two females is out of harmony with what God created. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a presumption for mankind to define it as such. Interestingly, I feel a lot of this comes from these old, very archaic notions that the family lineage is, of most, is the most important thing to maintain on the planet. I can't agree with that. We are all one family, so we are all of one lineage, and we don't need to define ourselves by what family or race we came from. We don't need to even define ourselves about you know, what, how our parents got together. The reality is a homosexual couple is capable of giving children love in a loving environment just as much as a heterosexual couple is capable of doing the same thing. That is the physical reality. Now, the homosexual couple is not, is not capable of creating the child, but as I've just pointed out, creation of the child is not really a true notion. God created the child, and all we're doing is creating the bodies for the child to live in. So, so we are not creating the child. We are creating the bodies in which the child, or which the child uses in order to experience its life. And there are many, many people on this planet who have too many children who they cannot love and cannot care for. And I'm sure very many homosexual couples who are in a monogamous relationship with each other would love to express their love for the rest of those children's lives towards those particular children if they had the opportunity. And it's very, very unfortunate that the majority of governments and religions 
still have these huge notions about whether procreation is the main issue. And God, from God's perspective, it is not. You know, love is the main issue, not procreation. Sure. Yeah. Okay, so the second of Caroline's questions is, if parenthood is a gift that God gives us to help us develop in love and highlights our law of attraction, why would God inhibit homosexuals from procreative power? Well, again, can you see in the question there is this linkage between procreation and the gift of being a parent. There is no reason why any homosexual couple on the planet couldn't be a parent. They could, they could be given the gift of a child that, that somebody else hasn't wanted or some accident has befallen the parents or something like that and then bring up the child in complete harmony with love. So this whole concept that somehow the gift of parenthood comes from procreation is a part of the problem. Mm -hmm. The gift of parenthood does not come from procreation. It comes from a desire to love an individual child for the rest of its life until it's able to so support itself. Mm -hmm. And, and this is what a true parenthood really is. Unfortunately, not many people on the planet believe that. They believe parenthood is more about ownership than about love given to the child until such a point of time that the child itself defines itself through its own interactions with the world. Mm -hmm. And so I feel it's very important for people to understand the difference between procreation, which is a physical act, and parenthood, which is an act of love given towards somebody, whether they are your own child or not. So many people who have adopted children uh, are still called the parents of those particular children. And there's no reason why a homosexual couple should be precluded from being a parent of a child. Um, and there are many people who would be, be willing and, and who are able and, or not able to care for their own child, children and would be totally willing to give the, that child to a couple who would be willing to care for it. The whole notion though that it has to be a couple that cares for the child is also flawed in the sense that uh, many times uh, the couple is imposing its own desire to have a, its own ownership over the child. That's why they want their own child. The reality is we can interact with children on a daily basis, whether we have children or not, mm -hmm. and we can learn many things through that process of giving the gift of our love to them and understanding the relationship that we have between our, ourselves and them. So, so I, I don't see even that as, a, as an issue either. Just because a couple decide that they wish to have no children of their own, it doesn't automatically make them a, a lesser member of society, or also it doesn't automatically make them unable to understand love. Mm -hmm. um, the reality is there's many things that they can see happening around them that would cause them to understand love quite easily, so I don't feel it causes an inability to understand love. Sure. Mm. Okay. All right. Um, if a homosexual union on earth is a part of God's plan, mm -hmm. then why weren't our bodies created so that we could have sex with males or females and enjoy um, the same type of double orgasmic experience? Well, again, I feel this come, question comes from a misunderstanding of homosexual relationships. The, relation, the, the reality is that uh, homosexual couples can have a double orgasmic experience and can have uh, you know, a beautiful sex life with each other in a, in, a, in a manner that is in complete harmony with the other principles of God's laws of love, mm -hmm. which include a mo monogamous relationship. And so you know, the reality is that some of the, I feel a lot of heterosexuals do not understand homosexual uh, relationships. Now, that's partly because they have never had one themselves, and I'm not recommending they do. Obviously, if you have a heterosexual desire, you won't want to have a homosexual relationship. But what I'm recommending to them is to listen to the people who are speaking about these relationships and, and come to understand what kind of sexual relationship they actually do have before they make a judgment about that relationship, about whether that's going to be truly fulfilling or not. There are, there are many uh, women in homosexual relationships who have what, she, what uh, Caroline is calling a double orgasmic experience. In other words, clitoral and vaginal uh, orgasm. And, and if you discuss those particular things with those people, you would find that out if you, if you discussed it. Um, the only reason why I know that is through 2,000 years of observing couples and listening to their stories, and I know that that is, is the case. So this judgment that we have, uh, that many heterosexuals have towards homosexual sexual relationships is already flawed uh, mm -hmm. because it's already 
uh, a misunderstanding of what really goes on in the homosexual relationship from a sexual perspective. Um, I also feel that uh, many religions have, have taken on these particular belief systems from ages past and, and have enforced these belief systems through th threat of penalty of God's disapproval of the homosexual couple. The reality is God created uh, home, what you would classify as homosexual souls. In other words, souls that when they split into two halves have a preference for the same body. And uh, in other words, one half has a preference for a male body and the other half has a preference for a male body. Or one half has a preference for a female body and the other half has a preference for a female body. I personally don't agree with bisexuality because um, that is not what, you know, there's no such thing as a soul that has a preference for both kinds of bodies. That usually comes through some kind of injury, injury process and most of the time it comes through an injury of the parents not wanting the child to be homosexual in nature and therefore wanting the child to have heterosexual and homosexual uh, feelings and this causes a lot of turmoil emotionally inside of the child and causes attractions that would not normally be present if they'd been allowed to develop freely without this heavy projection from their environment. Mm -hmm. So I feel with regard to all the questions surrounding homosexuality that are related to families, there is a gross distortion in the understanding of a homosexual relationship and the capacity of homosexual people to be, uh, to be able to give love. They have exactly the same capacity to give love as a heterosexual couple. And, uh, and no more, no less, and if they develop their relationship with God, they have a higher capacity to give love than if they don't. Mm -hmm. They're just the same as a heterosexual couple. There is no difference. Some of my closest friends in the first century have been homosexuals, and, uh, and I've understood their under underlying feelings, um, and understood that that was the way that they have actually been created as a part of their personal nature. Mm -hmm. Just because they cannot personally engage in procreation without breaking the bond of their sexual preference <coughs> in a natural way. <coughs> Let you have a cough. <coughs> Sorry. Sorry. <coughs> Get it out, babe. Mm -mm. It's always worse when you try and stop it, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Um, so just because they, um, you know, have a, a, um, a sexual preference that would preclude them from having a child, it doesn't mean that they cannot have children. It means that they cannot create the child's <coughs> bodies. <laughs> have a good cough. Was if, so just to recap, because we had a break. We had a break. Mary had a cough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bit of spirit interaction. <laughs> you were um, just sort of summarizing your answer to the third question which was if a homosexual union on earth is part of god's plan mm -hmm. then why weren't our bodies created so that we could have sex with males and females mm -hmm. and enjoy the same type of double orgasmic experience yes and as i answered in that answer it, it is possible to have sex and enjoy the same experience with the same gender so you know the reality is that uh, we need to understand that you know uh, uh, as as a human race we need to understand that i feel because there is so much anger and rejection of homosexuality on the planet and this anger and rejection has been present in human history for a long period of time now and because of this anger and rejection not many heterosexual people actually understand a homosexual relationship you know, it's obvious that many homosexuals do understand what's involved in a heterosexual relationship, mm. but very, very few uh, heterosexual couples actually understand what's involved in a homosexual relationship. And if they did understand, they would have a lot more uh, compassion and understanding to, to the, actual, the actual couples involved. In addition, they wouldn't ask silly questions. <laughs> <laughs> and I do believe that many of the questions that heterosexual couples ask of homosexuals with regard to their sexual relationship are quite strange questions, uh, given that you can easily think about it and find out the answer. But, but if not, sure, ask the question, but understand that a lot of these questions are not coming from an openness to understanding, but rather coming from a very closed perspective about what's involved in a homosexual union. Mm. 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 Okay, well, finally, <clears throat> did... So I suppose we need to address the issue with related to religion generally because uh, there is this issue where homosexuality is generally condemned by most of the world's major religions. 
If you look at all of the Christian faith, most of the Christian faith condemns a homosexual union. If you look at um, faiths like Buddhism, generally it condemns a homosexual union for very similar reasons. And the Muslim faith generally does the same as well. So, so if you look at most of the major faiths on the planet, there are some big issues that the, faith, that the religious faiths actually are facing right at this moment in time in terms of acceptance of a, a fairly large number of people on the planet. Mm. And it's, I, I find it quite sad that these religions keep perpetrating even violence towards these particular couples when the reality is they could understand them and, under, and, and ask a lot of questions that would cause them to understand God and the reason why God has actually created people with this kind of tendency towards each other, which is a, which is a natural tendency for their particular soul to experience. And if they understood the underlying principles and they understood the couples, they would understand too that their own belief systems have been created by mankind, not by God. Mm. And this is a very important thing to understand. If you look at many of the world's religions, they all say there is some kind of punishment due to a homosexual couple or a homosexual individual. And this is not the truth at all. In fact, in the spirit world, there are many, many homosexual couples who enjoy beautiful relationships with each other, with their soulmate, and who are also at one with God in their nature. And so it's very, very important for homosexual couples themselves to understand that there's nothing, nothing unnatural about it whatsoever. And it's very important for heterosexual couples and, and religions and politics to all understand the, uh, that there is nothing unnatural about it whatsoever. What is unnatural is having relationships with lots and lots and lots of different people. <laughs> that is unnatural. That is something God didn't intend for people to experience uh, without there being some pain associated with those kind of experiences. Because there, there are some penalties for breaking the law of love whenever we break it. And heterosexual couples are just as capable of having um, unnatural relations with other heterosexual people mm -hmm. as homosexual couples are. And we are also just as capable of what I would classify to be sexual immorality. So, so you know, our definition of what is moral is quite often quite hypocritical. So the, the very same people, generally, historically, who created this, uh, uh, this almost this abnormal fear against a homosexual union have also been the very same people that perpetrated the beliefs of, um, of polygamy and other such things. So, you know, I find that very interesting. Now, the, the same, a lot of times, exactly the same underlying emotional issues drive both belief systems, mm. polygamy and, and opposition towards homosexuality. Would you like to elaborate on that? Well, if you look at polygamy, one of the primary reasons for the creation of polygamy was that one man gets to enjoy many women, which is actually an immoral sexual thing from God's perspective. Secondly, that this one man has the ability, through his relationship with many women, to have many children, tens of, or even potentially hundreds of children, depending on how much of a polygamist he is, which is all about the extension of your genetic code into the next generation, which is the exact injury that I was talking about, the, this feeling of ownership of children. Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, the exact same thing that causes that same male to be against homosexuality is actually causing him to support polygamy. So I, I know that you spoke about that in one of the earlier interviews with Caroline mm -hmm. about this idea of having a, lots of children <clears throat> in order to c continue a faith on, mm -hmm. on earth. Do you feel that that is why, this is my question now, mm -hmm. do you feel that is why a lot of faiths are opposed to homosexuality because they, they see it as something that, a union that does not create children well i feel that is one of their motives yes certainly one of their motives if you look at the the growth of of religious faith on the planet a lot of the way that religious faith is enforced is through the family concept mm -hmm. a family who breaks the religious faith so a family member who breaks the religious faith and chooses another is also generally excommunicated not only from their religion but also from the family mm -hmm. In other words, the family heaps huge amounts of pressure upon that particular person to have them conform back into the religious faith. So obviously there is a huge amount of pressure upon people on this planet to stay in the same faith as their parents, to, to never change. 
And, and having children from a religious perspective causes people to believe that they will have many children to support the faith. And this is not God's intention to, for, or, or a good reason to have a child. A good reason to have a child is to love it and allow it its own free will for, of expression. And to train it, you know, that there are laws and that these laws can be broken. And the laws are not to do with faith, but rather to do with love. They're all surrounding the issues of love, not faith. Mm -hmm. So just because another person chooses, uh, someone in the family chooses a different faith, they should not automatically not be loved. You know, they should still be loved. Yes. And, and in fact, a, a truly loving family wouldn't be so addicted to a person having the same faith as themselves. And a lot of that is all about the parent believing that they know best and trying to enforce what they feel they know best about onto the child. Mm -hmm. And that is a very unloving act. And it also doesn't allow the whole of human society to grow very rapidly. Because naturally, if each successive generation finds out more about the world and, and science and life generally, then each successive generation is going to know more than the previous one. You know, you, you could say that we know right now far more than our forefathers about technology. Right? We understand how a lot of things work that they did not understand. And this is a natural process. It's interesting, we allow it in science, but we do not allow it in religious faith. We do not allow it in political, political ideology generally. These are areas that the family have strict control over and do not allow growth. Mm. And this needs to change. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay, finally from Caroline. Did you discuss homosexuality when you taught in the first century? Yes, in the first century I did mention homosexuality, of course. There were huge confrontations with different people who were even people who followed us in terms of the teachings in the first century. And as a result of that, many of the teachings that I gave about homosexuality never made it into the Bible ever. Mm -hmm. And that was because there was a huge amount of societal resistance towards the concepts of loving any person in the culture rather than just selectively choosing based upon your own fears. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, they also did not understand truly the concept of soulmates. They did not understand that there were there were some souls that were split and have the affinity towards the same body, and other souls split and have the affinity towards different bodies. Now, the the way that God created bodies is around 80 to 90 percent of of souls that split do have an affinity to the opposite body. So, in other words, one half an affinity to a male body, the other half an affinity to a female. And God created that, I believe, so that the human race could continue to procreate naturally and enjoy sexual union and pro procreation. But he didn't, he didn't do it to, uh, to then justify the unloving treatment of the other 20% of mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. right. Just from my own reflection, it would, because we, of what we understand from the vastness of what you've taught about homosexuality now, which obviously we're not able to summarize completely here mm. but there there would be different gifts amongst people who have a dominantly masculine soul or a dominantly feminine soul mm -hmm. but because the expression of masculinity and femininity on the planet is so often distorted, distorted mm. we don't fully receive those gifts either and right. i suppose because so many homosexual people are treated very harshly and yes rejected. A, lot, a lot of homosexual people because of the treatment that they have been under for many millennia mm -hmm. Um, they have a deeper level, deep level of anger and rage towards heterosexual society, which they express through ridicule, making up things, even drag and other things like that are often expressions of just confronting or being in the face of mm. people in the heterosexual community just to confront the uh, problem. Uh, many of them, if they, were, if they had grown up in an accepting environment, they wouldn't feel this deep need to rebel against the society because the society would have already accepted them. Mm. And the deep forms of rebellion that are present in almost all forms of human society often come from this deep underlying bigotry that is in human society towards different things. And, uh, you know, you look at a mainstream Christian society, it's got bigotry towards any other religion. A mainstream Muslim society often has a similar bigotry. Mm -hmm. And this is a problem, you know, when, when all of the religions learn to love and all of the people on the planet decide to love, even if, you know, it, 
even the you know the Christians love the atheist and the atheist loves the Christian and and no one's bigoted towards each other and their belief systems then we'll have a very harmonious society on the planet mm. but, but not until then and we'll and if all of us accepted all forms of things from a, from a love perspective, I'm not saying we have to accept untruth, but we need to treat people lovingly. And we don't have to accept being treated badly either, but we need to treat people lovingly and be firm for, the truth, for, for love. And when we do that, we actually become more accepting of everybody and more allowing of everybody's personal choices and decisions. And when we do that, they feel less need to rebel against our choice, against what we enforce. And this is the main problem with society as well. A lot of our, even a lot of our laws here in Australia, a lot of our laws have only recently, when I say recently, in the last 30 years, a lot of our laws have changed to, to have been more accepting towards homosexuality. But we still do not have a law in Australia that allows the marriage of homosexual and I'm not saying in Australia because there are some states in Australia that do but I mean as a whole of Australia there are still uh, states who will not accept a homosexual union as a marriage mm. and, and this is ludicrous really mm. um, but when you think about it it was only a hundred years ago that women couldn't vote either and women were treated like they weren't people either and, and you know this is an indication of the, the changes that we need to make we haven't we, we have come a certain distance over the last 100 years in terms of e equality, but we've still got a long way to go mm. to improve it. And I think we heard recently the statistic or the fact about just the legalisation of homosexuality has only occurred in this state that we're in today, in New South Wales, mm -hmm. in the last 35 years. That's right. Yeah, I think it was in, in the early 1980s or something. Yeah. So if you think about that, it's, you know, there's been thousands of years of homosexual couples on the planet and yet we've only just legalised it. How slow are we really? <laughs> and if you look at reli religion, religion is one of the reasons why we're slow because there is this belief system in religions generally that, that homosexuality is somehow you know that god hates it mm. in fact there's a you know there's some statements in the bible that would tend to indicate that god doesn't hate anything for a start you know god is not wrathful not angry not not punishing or any of those things god doesn't have a vendetta god is not resentful mm. you know these concepts of a wrathful god cause religions to enforce concepts upon people that are obviously out of harmony with love and this is especially being the case with homosexual people. And this is, this is very, very damaging to them, but it's also damaging to the rest of society because we do not get to explore the richness of our society without, while, while we condemn one type of persons in, in our society. Yeah. Yeah. And they are not unusual, they are naturally created. And this is what I, you know, I can't stress enough. God created them. They are created this way uh, as a way of a, a, an expression, a part of an expression of God's personality, actually. Mm -hmm. And we need to have, have more contact and more understanding before we'll understand God more. Yeah. That's the reality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in terms of the Mormon religion or Mormon faith, I don't see them as any different to any other Christian faith who condemns homosexuality for very, very similar reasons. Yeah. And I don't see them any different as many of the other faiths, such as Buddhism and, and the Muslim faith, Islam, uh, who also have a tendency to con condemn homosexuality for very, very similar reasons. Mm -hmm. You know, they are all very similar in that they all condemn it for the reasons mentioned. And, and it's time that we saw this in a completely different light than we're currently seeing it. Mm. Mm. Okay. Mm. All right, in part two of the Mormon interview, mm -hmm. you discuss the temple and how in reality priesthood ordinances have no bearing upon progression towards God in the spirit world. Mm -hmm. If this is true, then why did you get baptised? Well, there's this concept, unfortunately, that my baptism was somehow significant to anyone else other than myself. The reason why I got baptised was because I had a personal feeling to mark, if you like, the, a, a transition that I'd just been through, which is a transition between, you know, between the seventh and the eighth dimension of the spirit world, which is what I call the transition of becoming at one with God. I had just personally gone through that particular experience 
And so I visited my friend, John, who was also my cousin, whom I, you know, who had a, a long relationship with on, on the earth in the, in the first century, from the time we were about 12 or 13 years of age. And I wanted to mark this occasion through a personal experience. And the personal experience was baptism. Now, John was already baptizing other people as a form of de demonstrating repentance. Um, but I, I didn't feel I was need, doing that for that reason. Um, I did it through a, this personal feeling that I had between myself and God that I wanted to, to mark the very significant occasion of the first person on this planet ever becoming at one with God. And that was a personal decision that I made. And it wasn't, if I'd known that it was going to be misconstrued and taken out of context so many times since, I might not have done it, but, uh, but it was still a personal decision I made at the time that I wanted to, to do. All right. Can you explain then John 3, 5, which states, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Mm. So in that, in that statement, I was basically saying that a man has to be born of the, wa born of the water or, or from the water, away from the water, in fact, is the, is the terminology that I was using in the first century, and away from the spirit in order to become at one with God. In other words, the man had to connect with his soul in order to become at one with God. He needed to forget about the water-based body, which is the physical body that we have, which is around, what, 70% plus of water, mm -hmm. and that's why I referred to it as such. And he also had to forget about the spirit body, of which in the first century there was very little knowledge, but and which I often refer to in, in all of my discussions with people. And he had to be born of those things. He had to, he had to move away from those particular, the focus on those particular two things. And he had to now begin to focus upon the development of his soul. Mm -hmm. And unless he did that, unless he was born of the water, away from this water, and born from, from, the, uh, from the spirit, away from the spirit, and, and experience this new birth, the birth into the soul, mm -hmm. he was never going to be able to become at one with God. So that was, that was the, my meaning in the first century when I said that. Of course, uh, later revisionists of the Bible didn't understand what I was saying. Mm -hmm. And so uh, many people have postulated many concepts about those particular statements. And some feel that I was referring to my, my, my own baptism, which I was not. Mm -hmm. And some feel that I was referring to other things, uh, which I was not. <laughs> I was just referring to this, uh, this concept that we had to forget about our physical body we had to forget about a spiritual body because they are just robots that our parents created, as we were saying earlier. And we had to now focus on the soul because the soul is the true person, the mm -hmm. true nature of the person. And if that soul experienced this new birth, then that soul would become at one with God. And that's the primary purpose of that discussion. Mm -hmm. And if you look in John, the book of John, in the early parts of the book of John, you'll see that I was referring to this new birth, this process of becoming at one with God in context. And this is what I was always referring to whenever I spoke with people about what it meant to have a relationship with God. Mm. Mm. Okay. Was John the Baptist teaching baptism as an essential step towards God? Well, yes, John, John uh, wasn't really teaching baptism as an essential step towards God. What he was doing was he was teaching that repentance was an accept, was a essential step towards God. And I, in this issue, I agreed with John completely. I, I felt personally that repentance and forgiveness are the two most important things that you can engage in your process of becoming at one with God. And I still feel that right now. Now, just recently we gave a talk in Brazil that was all about repentance and forgiveness and those two particular concepts. Now, John and I had had many discussions uh, over the years about that, so he had come to accept that as well, the importance of repentance. Now, repentance is a process by, via which a person can examine themselves and see what they've done wrong in their life and wish to change it, have a desire to change it. So they examine themselves, they emotionally can see what is going on, and they desire to change that particular thing. Now, in that process, what, with regard to repentance, what we, what we get is this beautiful process of getting closer to God and closer to God each time we engage this process of repentance. Now, I might just pause for a moment while the guys do what they need to do. It's okay. 
So the process of repentance is a very essential part of us getting closer to God and also closer to ourselves, actually. We need to understand all the reasons why we have done things that are out of harmony with love and truth. And we need to you know, look at ourselves and see the underlying emotional reasons why we've chosen such actions. Now, John was a firm believer in that particular principle. And so he used to encourage people to repent, you know, repent from the sins that they, oh, that they had committed. His definition of sin was different to mine. <laughs> he, he felt that if a person didn't follow certain things in the law, then they were sinners and therefore had to repent. Whereas I did not feel some of those law-based issues had anything to do with the issue of repentance. So we, we, we differed on the details, if you like, of what, re, what we needed to repent about. But because John was, uh, often would precede me in, in terms of into town or something, particularly for the first six months of my ministry, and he would say, repent for the kingdom of God is drawn near, and those kind of statements he would make. And, and in symbol of repentance, he would encourage people to be baptised. In other words, he would actually, the, the symbol of the baptism was that they, they go under the water, they have now realised what was in their past life and come to accept the underlying reasons why they chose to do the damaging things they chose in their past life. And then as they come out of the water, you know, that was a sort of symbol that they are now being wiped clean of those particular things because they have repented from those particular things. So he saw it as a bit of a symbolic thing. And this is why he encouraged people to, to come to him as a, as a symbol of, their, of the fact that they had repented. Of course, it was just a symbol. It had no physical effect on the human body. It has no effect on the soul whatsoever, the actual process of baptism. And it has no effect on the spirit body. Uh, I should say it has one effect on the physical body, and that is you get wet. But aside from that, <laughs> it has very little other effect, right? And so, um, and so, you know, it has no importance in the process of any person's faith. Mm -hmm. However, these kind of symbologies can have importance in a person's faith, in that a person can look back at the time and go, yes, well, that was the feeling I had at that point in time, and they can reflect upon that particular feeling. So... It sort of marks a time period in a person's life. And there's many times in our lives where we mark time periods or we mark experiences in celebration. You know, uh, a couple today generally have an anniversary of their marriage for, for that reason. Mm -hmm. They're marking the fact that they had this, you know, desire to love each other so much that they wanted to live the rest of their life together. And so they're marking that desire mm -hmm. as, a, as, a, as a symbolic action. The marriage itself is only retained while they love each other. Mm. You know, if they don't love each other anymore, the marriage has now failed. Right? But while they love each other and while this symbol exists, they are reminded of their love for each other, which is often a good thing. Mm -hmm. So I don't see any problem with these symbols. I see a problem with, uh, with, with exaggerating their significance. Mm. And I feel that religious faith, Christian religious faith, has exaggerated the significance of my own baptism. Which probably leads nicely to the next question, which is, can you explain how the doctrine of baptism for remission of sins gained traction after your death? Mm -hmm. And did you take any steps at that time to correct the error on earth? Well, yes, uh, the way it uh, gained popularity after my death was uh, it really came from this amalgamation of the, of the Jewish faith with, with my teachings that I was teaching, which would, let's call them the basic teachings of Christianity. So, so what happened was that there were people who were listening to my teachings who were still members of the Jewish faith. And many of these wanted to get patterns that were in their faith that they could absorb into the new faith that they were trying to understand. Now, the old faith said that once a year, a lamb was sacrificed for the sins of the nation. This lamb was a lamb that was meant to be pure, uh, uh, the best of the flock, and it was sacrificed by the priest if for the sake of the Israelite nation's sins. And this was something that happened every single year, once a year, in the, in the, in the uh, temple. 
in the most holy of the temple. The blood was taken into the most holy of the temple as, and presented as a sacrifice to God that everybody recognised their sins that they had committed throughout the year and felt repentant for those particular sins. And the idea was that God would absolve them of their sins through this sacrifice. Of course, it's all untrue. God doesn't absolve people's sins through any sacrifice whatsoever. But it was a belief system that was retained by the Jewish faith. And, and unfortunately, they tried to then turn me into the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So what they tried to do is they tried to make a lot of parallels between this old faith and the new faith that had now been introduced or that had been just introduced to them. And unfortunately, because I wasn't around on earth to correct such uh, concepts, um, many people started embracing these particular concepts and started, there, there became a merger between the teachings that I was teaching, the true teachings of the true Christian faith, if we could call it that, and then all of these old concepts and old teachings that people wanted to amalgamate into these new teachings that they were receiving. So as a result of that, they began to believe that uh, my blood would take away their sin and all of these kind of concepts. None of, none of these concepts I ever taught or have ever taught. And by the way, they are all not true. It's impossible for my blood from any perspective to take away anybody's sins. But let's look at it from a physical perspective. My blood, as soon as I die, is poured out on the ground and it is converted into the elements through a process of decomposition. How, what physical role could, could it have other than feeding some plants or animals for a very short period of time uh, after that? None whatsoever. There is no scientific basis for it having any, for any further impact. But there is also no spiritual basis because the reality is that each person has to has inside of their soul a record of every single thing that they have done out of harmony with love. And my blood cannot save them from that record. That record is permanently within them and can only be released from them through a process of repentance and forgiveness. And, uh, and there's nothing that my blood achieves in, in that process. And my blood is not even a symbol of that process. Yeah. So it's totally impossible for my blood to save anybody. And it's always been impossible for my blood to save anybody. Yes, even the, even the reference to the blood as a symbol of your sacrifice mm -hmm. is not. Um, yeah, even but, that reference was never made. How is it then, uh, you were speaking about baptism, mm -hmm. was, there a, was there a practice of baptism in Judaism that they transferred over? Or well no, this was an amalgamation of what John was doing. So John, John uh, um, and many of his followers began following uh, the Christian faith as well, and, and they amalgamated these teachings of baptism into the process, because that was something that they were addicted to following. And the reason why they were adapted to it was because John did it. And, and they, in their honour of John, they created a process which they felt honoured him and honoured the process of repentance. And so they then said, basically, that baptism needed to be introduced into the Christian faith. And, and also there was this double uh, reason, and that was that I had been baptised. <laughs> and so they added that to the main reasons why anybody else should be baptised. And there is no significance, unfortunately, to, for most of them who are being baptised. Many of them are not repenting from their own sins, mm -hmm. for a start, so they have no significance related to John's in, underlying motive. And many of them have not become at one with God, or everyone who's ever been baptised on the planet have never become at one with God, aside from myself. And for that reason, there's no significance to my baptism with their own experience either. Mm -hmm. So I find that, that it's quite, you know, the reality is um, we, we do not need to be baptised in order to be at one with God. You may want to mark the occasion once you become at one with God, just as you might like to mark the occasion once you start to go through the process of repenting for what you've mm -hmm. done wrong. But, but there is no religious or significance with God in the process. So why do you think it gained traction? Simply because you had done it, John had done it, and people were attracted to this idea of repentance? No, it's deeper than that. There is this underlying feeling that people have that they want a simple way to gain salvation. They don't want salvation to be dependent upon their true feelings being exorcised. In other words, their true feelings out of harmony with love being removed from their own soul. Mm -hmm. They don't want to go through the pain of that. They don't want to go through the whole process of that they feel that's very, very confronting. So what they want instead 
is a very simple way to become a better person. And that is to, to believe that all you have to do is believe in the blood of Jesus or, and be baptised. And man, all of my sins have gone and now I'm a perfect person and now everything's right with the world. And obviously, through their conduct and behaviour, you can see that that's not the truth at all. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but unfortunately, they wish to believe it. Real change doesn't happen that way. Of course, it doesn't happen that way. And God is only interested in real change. He's not interested in the facade of change. But we on earth have become addicted to the facade of change. And this is why we've become addicted to ritual. We've become addicted to the ritual of baptism. We've become addicted to the ritual of the Eucharist. You know, that, that my blood and body somehow saves a person, which, are, which is impossible to occur, both scientifically and spiritually. And, and yet we've become addicted to those processes, primarily because we want a simple way of doing it. And we don't have, want to have to go through the actual process of change, which can be very, very difficult and at times very challenging. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We also don't want to pay for the penalty of our own behaviour. We want other people to do it. This whole concept of Christ dying for my sins is, a, is this concept. That is me wanting somebody else to pay for what I've done. Now, if I was truly a just person, truly a person who is interested in integrity, I would never want somebody else to pay for what I've done. The fact that I want somebody else to pay for what I've done means that I don't want to take responsibility for my life. God never allows us to make somebody else responsible for our life. Mm -hmm. We are perfectly responsible for our own life. And if we've done things that are out of harmony with love, we will have that penalty inside of our soul already. It's already there. Nobody else can pay for it. Nobody else can release it. Nobody else can um, you know, cleanse it or any other some kind of mystical operation. None of those mystical operations can occur. The only thing that can happen is for me to embrace the process of changing it myself. Mm. That is the only real thing that can happen. And, and for anybody to believe otherwise, they have to believe in very fanciful ideas, none of which can ever be proven. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Okay, you've touched uh, a little on the last question, but mm -hmm. Um, from Caroline, what about the sacrament or communion ordinance that Mormons and many other religions practice? Mm -hmm. Can you explain what went on during the night of the Last Supper and how that event got misinterpreted? Sure. In the night of the Last Supper, or the so-called Last Supper, we've just basically had a bit of a gathering or what people nowadays might call a party. And, you know, because many of us were in Jerusalem uh, for only a period of a couple of weeks, we managed to meet many of our friends and acquaintances that we hadn't seen for, for, for some time, usually for at least one year. And, and so we decided to have a get together, just as people do, of all sorts of people. You were there, you know, the, all the women were there as well as the men and uh, many of their wives and children were there. It was just a normal gathering. Of course, I did sometimes teach them things at those gatherings and that was a gathering that you know that you and I both feel emotional about because of the teaching that we had about you know the humility of washing someone's feet and the importance of serving another person doing a job that normally a slave would do mm -hmm. uh, even and you know the significance of that particular act is what both of us felt was the most important part of the night probably however um, what's happened since is that it's been portrayed as a, a, a celebration that I knew that I was going to die. And while I was aware generally that I was going to die in the future, I didn't feel that it was necessarily going to be the next day. Mm -hmm. I realized that there were certain problems occurring in amongst the uh, high priests and the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the, even in the Roman uh, at the time that were all being caused to stir because of my being present in Jerusalem at the time. but. I didn't uh, feel that my death was going to happen tomorrow. It was only later in the evening after the supper that I felt some lack of safety for you and sent, sent you off to a, a different place than I was and, 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 um, and basically felt some sense of lack of safety for myself as well, which John, who had this, by this stage died, uh, talked to me about in spirit. Um, but. There was no significance to the actual night aside from that. Uh, we did not install or initiate any process of, you know, my blood being like the wine and 
the bread being my body and these things being a symbol of a person being saved. As I've said previously, it's totally physically impossible for my body or the blood, my blood from the first century to save anybody um, just because it's just a, an organism that passes as soon as the breath of life it was extinguished from my body. So there was no significance in the process whatsoever. But this idea that your sacrifice may, just as you talked about the sacrificial lamb earlier, obviously yeah. this is the motivation for... Yes, later Bible revisionists um, who wanted to amalgamate the sacrificial lamb principle with the blood and the body of this lamb being the sacrifice that takes away the Israelites' nation's sin. They wanted to compare that. Uh, and that was also instigated a bit by Paul as well. He, he had that idea that, you know, he felt the symbology of it, let's call it that. Um, he didn't feel uh, that it was something that needed to happen necessarily, but he felt the symbology of it. And he felt it was a symbol of, you know, the fact that my coming to the earth was a part of, you know, people learning the truth that eventually can save them. So he understood what, what was called the saving process that of my presence on the earth in the first century but but unfortunately it got highly distorted after that and 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 re revised and all of these uh, principles amalgamated with each other and so what we ended up with was a belief system that my blood blood and my body somehow saved people from their sins and that were a sign of them being saved if they accepted my blood and my body and the whole concept of take eat this means my body and take eat drink this means my blood would have actually horrified me in the day because I was a, a vegan at the time and I would never have eaten or drank, and drank blood or eaten the body of anything at that point in time. I stopped eating meat when I was around 13 years of age in the first century and, uh, and the whole concept of, um, of you know, drinking someone's body or eating someone's, drinking someone's blood or eating someone's body you know, is, is a concept that... I, I, I fail to have any um, attraction to what's you know I can't sure. I can't be attracted to it whatsoever. Yeah. But um, I understand why religions have taken it on um, because they do want this simple process of being saved. They want you know they don't want themselves to take full responsibility for their lives. They don't want to take full responsibility for their personal actions. They like some of the concept that somebody else can come along and pay for their actions and and, and their problems. And uh, this concept is very, very flawed, very dangerous concept actually, because it causes many people to believe that they can do things over and over again. And, and just by accepting the blood or body of Jesus, those things get wiped away from them. Mm -hmm. And many of these people, when they pass into the spirit world, feel like they think they're passing into a place where they're going to be in a good condition. And unfortunately, because of their justification of their own actions, they're in a very, very bad condition. And, uh, and many of them are severely disappointed because of this teaching. Mm. Mm. Okay. Um, the next section speaks to some Mormon practices specifically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'd just like to acknowledge that I'm not a Mormon, so I just want to be very sensitive to how, how I um, present these questions mm -hmm. because there's no disrespect at all intended. I just want to be able to ask some things about yes. it. Yes. Yep. Okay, so when Mormons receive their complete endowment for the first time, mm -hmm. they receive a washing where they are cleansed from the blood and sins of their generation. Yes, it's a symbolic washing, very similar to the washing that John the Baptist, in fact, was teaching in the first century. Well, and Caroline says, mm -hmm. some believe this is a symbolic washing, mm -hmm. while others claim it is a literal washing of sins. Mm -hmm. Also at this time, an anointing with oil takes place where the participant is anointed as a priest or priestess to the Most High God mm -hmm. and various parts of the body are blessed to perform to their best of their ability. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to wash generational sin away through a priesthood ordinance? No. <laughs> okay. In your opinion, what does the phrase blood and sin mean? Well, again, this, uh, um, sin, sin is a term that, let's start with the term sin. Sin is, sin is very easy to understand. Mm -hmm. the, it came from a Greek word that meant missing the mark of a target. So imagine you had a bullseye and you're shooting an arrow towards, the, towards a target and the bullseye is the mark you're trying to aim for and when you missed that mark, you've sinned. Mm -hmm. you, in other words, you've no longer been able to be perfect 
in, in attaining the particular goal you were obtaining. When we talk about sin, if, when I talked about sin in the first century, and when we talk about sin now, I'm talking about missing the mark of perfection in love. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that every time that we do that, we are sinning. We have missed the mark, and, it, and therefore we have sinned. Unfortunately, it's taking on huge connotations of punishment and uh, rage from God and wrath and all these other concepts which, uh, which were not intended and never, and never felt in the first century or, or, or since. But unfortunately, much of Earth has taken on these particular concepts of sin. So sin now is very much associated with punishment with, with, and with judgment and with being, uh, and in fact being condescended to and belittled and being treated badly. And this is not the intention of the word, because the word is just a statement of an action that you didn't hit what you were intending to hit. Mm. You know, it's a, that's all the word means. And, uh, and so I feel the word sin can still be used if people understand its under, underlying meaning. Blood and sin, though, is a different issue. The reason why I feel blood and sin were amalgamated together is what we've already explained, which is this whole concept that somehow my blood takes away from a person the actions that they've taken that have been out of harmony with love. In other words, their sin. And this is not possible, but uh, it is something that people believe. And it was believed because it was also believed in the Jewish faith before I arrived on earth. Mm -hmm. It was something that was brought forward from that faith into the Christian faith. Mm. Mm. Okay, so what is your definition of generational sin and how is it cleansed? Well, generational sin is actually missing the mark. Let's say the parent misses the mark of love. When they miss the mark of love, the way that God's universe works is that every time we miss the mark of love, there is an automatic correction that occurs inside of the soul. So there's pain automatically that appears inside of the soul as a feeling, as an emotion. This pain exists now within us. Now, unless we release that pain through an emotional process of repentance, unless we release that pain, it's, that pain remains in us. And, and unfortunately, if I then have a child, that pain through my emotional expression will be passed through the, as an emotion and imposed upon the child. So now the child is growing up in an environment where that pain is accepted. And that's generational sin. And that gets passed from parent to child, parent to child, parent to child, over many generations. And many generations have it passed that there are some sins or things that our society believes are out of harmony with love that are being passed down from generation to generation to generation. Let's look at one of them that we've already discussed. The sin of conceiving that a homosexual person is out of harmony with God. That is a sin because it's out of harmony with love. Mm -hmm. And yet the majority of heterosexual people on this planet have it. Because it's been passed down as an emotion, as a belief system and an emotion, from parent to child, parent to child, parent to child, down through many, many millennia of generations. Sadly, I've spoken to homosexual people who've also inherited that belief, which causes them a great deal of uh, pain. Yes, so often you have a heterosexual couple who has a homosexual child, because the heterosexual couple still have that belief in their heart, and, and when they have the homosexual child, of course the homosexual child is going to carry that belief. Mm. So even the homosexual child doesn't even understand why it feels its own guilt that, it, that it's doing the wrong thing. But it's got nothing to do with God. It's got everything to do with what the parents believed and have imposed upon the child. That's a generational sin. So that's a generational sin. Mm. Caroline's question is how do we cleanse if, if these... Um, um, if these things that Mormons commonly do, you've stated categorically, do not cleanse, cleanse generational sin, sin. Mm -hmm. how does one go about cleansing generational sin? Okay, so the way, so this sin exists in inside of us because of the mechanism that I've described. The way it comes out of us is exactly the same way that it, that any sin comes out of us, and that is through an emotional process of repenting for the lack of love that's within us. Mm -hmm. So, so I need to come to see. For example, with the homosexual issue, I would need to come to see that my belief systems about homosexuality are false. I would need to see how my belief system has created harm to the homosexual community, 
right? I would need to feel what it would feel like to be judged as much as the homosexual community has been judged through this feeling that I have. Mm -hmm. And I would go through the process with God of repenting for such an action, of, for, for such a belief. Whether that belief came from my father, mother, sister, brother, or, or any other place in the environment is immaterial. Mm -hmm. The way to cleanse generational sin is exactly the same way to cleanse all sin. Mm -hmm. And that is to realize the error, go through the process, the emotional process of repentance and the emotional process of forgiveness of yourself as well. And you get to the point then where you no longer have the emotional belief system that, that for example, in the example I've given that homosexuality is wrong. And once you've gone through that in proce process, you have automatically been forgiven because you've gone through the process. You now long, no longer do not carry those particular emotions that have caused the belief to be fostered. Mm. So just to clarify, most of us would be carrying sins or errors in love within us mm -hmm. that have effectively been passed, been passed down to us. That is generational sin. Yes. But the only way to be cleansed of that sin is to engage a personal process, process with God. Yes. Yeah. If, we, if we can see that um, the problem with generational sin is that because it's entered our psyche before generally we were of an age of seven, in other words, before we had the time to develop our intellect, we have already received these particular beliefs. Mm -hmm. So we have no logic associated with these beliefs, unfortunately. The problem with that is that we then grow up believing that many of these beliefs are true. And we have no logical reason why we believe they're true most of the time, mm -hmm. but we have a deep emotional belief that they are true, which causes us to be very, very resistant to be repentant for them. Mm -hmm. So this is the problem with generational sin. The problem with it is that it's imposed upon us from the time we enter the womb, from the time of you know, the germination of our bodies, from that initial point of time, from the time the incarnation actually occurs, which is when contraception occurs, and shortly after that period, Conception. Conception, sorry, okay, it's not contraception. <laughs> and so when conception occurs, shortly at that period, short, at the same time, generational sin begins to enter us, mm. but we do not have the intellectual development to resist it. So the problem is by the time we're seven years of age, we have already absorbed all this generational sin. And the problem is we believe it to be true. Mm. That's the issue we face. And this is why people fight so much for these beliefs, because they actually believe it to be true emotionally without there being any logic applied to the situation. And that is because the emotion was present in them before their develop, the development of their mind f finished. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and this is the big problem with the release of generational sin. It is more difficult generally to release generational sin than to be conscious of our own sin mm -hmm. that we have actually uh, embraced during the course of our life. Often we feel bad about certain things that we have done and, uh, and then we have you know, some realizations. But when it comes to the generational sin that's present in us, we believe it to be normal. Mm. And because we believe it to be normal, we often don't see it as a sin. So for example, if a person grew up with a, with a feeling inside of them from their parents that were already in their parents, that, that black people were a lower race, unfortunately, they will have a feeling that black people are a lower race before they think logically about it. This causes them to be racist without even really knowing why. And those kind of generational sins are much more difficult to release because our parents and their grandparents and their parents and their parents and so forth all believed the same thing. And there's also this burden of spirits around the person who still believe the same thing, causing them to be blind to the untruth, to be blind to the sin. And, uh, and this is very, very dangerous for our society if we really want to grow. We need to understand that we need to break away from our parents' definition of what is right and what is wrong. And we need to use our logic that God has given us to look more sincerely at what is obviously right and what is obviously wrong. And it's pretty obvious that whatever causes pain to another person, 
you know, if, if we're treating another person how we would not like to be treated ourselves, this underlying principle of ethics, then we need to understand that anything that, that does that is, out, is sin, is out of harmony with the laws of love. Mm. Mm. Okay. So that's how we release generational sin. Yes. Not through a process uh, as are in the Mormon religion, this process of this cleansing anointing process. But in other religions, there are different types of processes. You know, people believe that, you know, there are some religions, of course, Christian faiths, that believe there's no such thing as being able to release sin. Mm. You know, they believe that we are always sinners for the rest of our existence. And it's only the blood of Jesus that saves us. And that's not true either. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be a sinner for the rest of your existence. You can repent from what you do and change. And therefore, you won't be a sinner for the rest of your existence. Mm -hmm. Mm. Okay. You've been referred to in the Bible as the anointed one. Mm -hmm. Was there any significance to this title in the first century? And in your view, can anointing with oil have any effect on our bodily functions? Is it God's will that we receive an anointing? Okay, so let's look at the first question, whether there was any significance to, you know, my being anointed in the first century or being called the anointed one. Well, yes, there was. Um, I was the very first person on this planet to become at one with God. And, and in that regard, I was anointed with God's love, if mm -hmm. you like. Mm -hmm. And this was the whole symbology of my baptism, was the, the process that I was now anointed with God's love. I had become at one with God and my life from that moment on by the time and I was 31 years of age at that time my life from that time on demonstrated that I had been anointed by God with God's love to the point where I'd become at one with God now um, of course being anointed with oil or something like that was not something that I did although um, often I had my hair uh, I put oil in my hair and then put it into a bun in the first century to just keep it out of my way while I was working and so forth so, you know, that often happened, but um, the actual process of being anointed uh, was not something that physically happened. There were people who honoured the fact that they could feel that I was at one with God, and therefore some people did, you know, uh, at times call me the anointed one or the one favoured by God. I don't believe, I didn't personally believe that, that I was favoured by God. I just believed that... Uh, or that I was the only person who could be favoured by God is probably the better way of saying it. I didn't believe that and I still don't believe that. But a person who desires this relationship with God will be favoured by God. Mm -hmm. that, that is the reality. Uh, when I say favoured by God, I, what I mean is that if you desire the relationship with God and you work your way through the emotional issues that prevent this relationship, then, then you will experience the love that God has to give you. If you do not do that, then you won't experience the love that God has to give you and therefore you could be, it could be said to be a favoured position. Um, but any person is able to enter that position, mm -hmm. any person who's ever existed, including people on earth and in the spirit world. Mm -hmm. So the anointing was really, uh, again, a symbolic uh, process where, uh, a sim of symbology about my becoming at one with God. And as a result of that, sometimes after my death, people refer to me as the anointed one. Unfortunately, it's taken on this connotation that I was the only anointed one, mm -hmm. just like it's taken on the connotation that I was the only son of God. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's not true at all, but that's where religion has taken that particular concept. Um, so, yes, there is significance in me being that anointed one from the point of view of being the first person to have ever reached that condition of one with God. Um, is, however, is, can anointing with oil have any effect on our bodily functions and is it God's will that we receive anointing? No to both questions. It does not have uh, any effect on our bodily functions, obviously, and it does not mean that we have God's approval just because we've had some kind of physical act of anointing. Everything that God does is based upon our true feelings and our true heart-based feelings. This is something I stated over and over in the first century, some of which is retained in the Bible. And any time we believe that a process, a physical process, overcomes something that is a part of our nature, we are in error. The reality is that no physical process can ever overcome something that is a part of our personality, nature, or, or sin, if you like, what, what we've done wrong. We must go through an emotional process in order to change. No physical thing will do the job for us. 
Um, this is my question now. However, when we have a situation where there is, for example, a ritual like a baptism or anointing um, in some faiths, and there is a lot of emotion within the person and the people conducting the ritual with that person, mm -hmm. can that actually have an effect? Of course. The, oftentimes the emotion of a ritual overcomes a person and in that moment they generate some pure emotion. The pure emotion of desire to repent, for example, or pure emotion of desire to be a person who loves from that moment on. Pure emotion to do something. And in fact, if you look at most rituals, most rituals, if they're correctly uh, done, are because there was a pure motive beforehand, mm -hmm. not the other way around. Unfortunately, today I feel a lot of rituals are created to create a pure motive. Um, but uh, my feelings are that if the pure motive isn't present within the person before the ritual begins, then there's a high likelihood it's probably not going to be present after the ritual has completed. And, uh, and the ritual itself does nothing but, but be a symbol of a particular act that the person has taken in their heart. Now, if, if a, the problem with a ritual is just because you have the ritual, it doesn't mean you've taken the action in your heart. Mm. And this is where I feel Christianity fails people in that they believe that once a ritual is engaged, that the heart has changed. It does not mean that. God knows when the heart has changed and whether the ritual has been performed or not. Sure, sure. <coughs> okay. At the end of the washing and mm -hmm. anointing, we receive white underclothing, mm -hmm. which we treat as sacred and which, we, which are called the garment of the holy priesthood. Yes. It is difficult to discuss these garments because we are taught that they are supremely sacred and that we should not speak of them, nor let others look at them. Mormons are instructed to wear these garments under their clothing throughout our life, except when doing strenuous activities. Mm -hmm. These garments are said to be a shield and a protection to the wearer, and there are sev several symbols or signs sewn into the garments that are designed to remind the wearer of certain basic truths. Mm -hmm. If a person takes these garments off permanently, it is seen as a sign to God that the covenants they made in the temple have been broken. A decision to stop wearing one's garments is a sign that a person is mocking God. Mm. This is said to be a most grievous sin and unless a person continuously wears their garments, they are not allowed to participate in any temple ordinances, receive any high callings or attend any marriages in the temple. Furthermore, for those who take off their garments or who, wish to, or who do not wish to live, oh, sorry, furthermore, for those who take off their garments or who do not live up to the covenants in the temple, there are much more drastic and unmentionable punishments said to come after death. Mm. Can so we first, first discuss that a little bit? Sure. Firstly, I'd like to say to any Mormon listening to this is that we are not discussing this issue in order to sort of expose your faith or cause you any um, problems with your faith. We're discussing this issue because we've, we've talked to many spirits and also many people on earth who are part of the Mormon faith who have this deep symbology attached to these garments and they become very... Um, they become very worried about what will occur with regard to these garments and their relationship with God as a result of them. And we want to um, help these people uh, have a bit more relaxed viewpoint of the garments themselves by discussing this relationship between God and themselves, which, which actually is independent of the garments they wear. Um, and we'll talk about that. Mm. Mm. Okay, so the first question, does God require us to wear special underclothing in order to be exalted in heaven? No, well, if you look at the... No, the quick answer is, but if we look at the... Um, even the Bible's description of the first human couple, Adam and Eve, the Bible calls them, if we examine them, you can see that they walked about naked in the Garden of Eden and God had communication with them in a naked state. Mm -hmm. Now, this is an indication that God is okay to speak with people and communicate with people and interact with people while they are naked. And in fact, when you think about it, that is very logical. We enter the world naked. We generally leave it so. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's only us that decides generally to put the clothes on because of some other motivation. 
Now, if we look at the fact that we enter the world naked, we can see that, obviously, from God's perspective, nakedness is not a sin. Na- nakedness is not, not something that, that is a, a, a bad thing from God's perspective. And it is also obvious that clothing doesn't protect us spiritually. God, if God wanted us to be protected spiritually through our clothing, then I'm sure God would have created clothing that would protect us spiritually at the time of our conception. Um, uh, this is my questioning now along those lines. Yep. What about people who believe that um, if we have modest attire, that does protect us actually, not, uh, not in terms of God, but protects us from those around us who would... Um... Yes, we need to separate what it's protecting us from. Mm-hmm. So the reality is that if we have a belief that what we're doing protects us from the potential of God's wrath, there is no such thing as God's wrath. Mm-hmm. And so therefore there is no way that we can be protected, be protected from it yeah. because God never uh, demonstrates the feeling of wrath towards any person. God has no desire to punish. So if we're worried about God punishing us, we are again not conceiving God in the correct manner. God only wishes to love us, has no desire to punish us, has no desire to treat us with resentment or anger or rage, has no desire to torment us. Yeah. For, that, for those reasons, God will not ever punish us no matter what we do with our clothes. So the reality is a person can walk around with nothing on or they can walk around fully clothed with everything, including their eyes covered. Um, And from God's perspective, it is no different. However, there is a difference from man's perspective. Mm -hmm. And this is because we have a lot of unhealed emotions on this planet regarding sexuality, nakedness and nudity and so forth. As a result of that, when we are naked or we are nearly naked, we often attract unwelcome behaviour from other people. And this is an indication of their development rather than your own as to how unwelcome it is, uh, because these particular people ha- do not have a soulmate feeling towards their soul, other half of their soul, and so they are very attracted to looking and seeing other people in a naked state because it causes their sexual arousal or other, or other things to occur that causes them to feel excited. Now. That is an indication of the person's issue, not God's. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, because there is this sexual shame that exists on the planet and the shame of one's body that also exists on the planet, we have imposed upon God the principles of shame. In other words, we're we're trying to believe, we, we start believing after a while, that God actually does not want to see our shame. This concept began way, way back a long time ago. There is a record in the Bible of a man, uh, another man who may or may not have existed, shall we say. Uh, My personal opinion is I've met the man. He existed, but not what happened to him didn't happen as recorded in the Bible. And that's the man Noah. Mm -hmm. And uh, the man Noah um, was at one time got drunk and, and some parts of his family saw his nakedness. The man Lot also is another man in the Bible. It was a brother of Abraham and he got drunk and, uh, and his daughter saw his nakedness. And these things were said to be shameful things that have occurred. Now, this kind of shame, this sexual shame that gets perpetrated through society is what is creating a lot of the desire for people to wear the right clothes. Now, many religions today, we see women in particular. Interestingly, it's not so much the men who are prevented from from different actions in many religions. The Mormon religion is a bit more consistent in it. It's both the men and the women. But to other religions, it's, it's, it's only the women who are affected by these particular things. And so there is an inequality there as well. But the reality is a lot of these ideas that we can wear something to actually cover ourselves and therefore demonstrate our own uh, virginal purity, if we can call it that, um, is, is in fact flawed. And the reality from God's perspective is our purity comes from what's in our heart, not what's, what's displayed in our body. Mm. Okay. So if we look at the Mormon faith, specifically here, which we've been discussing, mm-hmm. um, I feel that the Mormon faith has constructed through these, uh, through, through these processes many concepts that have an underlying pure motivation. And the underlying pure motivation is that they want to retain a purity in their relationship with God. And this is a very good thing. We all, would, anybody who wants to have a relationship with God, in the end will want to retain a purity in that relationship. 
and they want to retain a feeling of repent you know they want to be repentant for the things that they have done wrong they want to have that feeling of repentance and many sincere christian people have exactly the same feelings but what they've done is create a physical outward show or in this case a show that's not outward but actually is to themselves and then they've put some store or they've put some uh, viewpoint that that its significance in the physical outward show the reality is a garment cannot protect us that's the reality it cannot protect us spiritually it cannot protect us emotionally it only can potentially protect us physically mm -hmm. that's really the only thing it can protect us from but from our relationship in our relationship with god we're looking at the spiritual and emotional sides of our relationship with god and the garment does not protect us. It may be a reminder to us of the need for protection. Mm -hmm. And it may be a symbolic action for the need of protection. But it is not the actual protector. It also, God has no feeling of significance towards the garment. So if we leave it off, mistakenly or purposefully, God is not now going to punish us with some unmentionable thing as a result of us leaving it off. If we did it as an attitude towards God of, of resistance towards God, then obviously the attitude towards God is the important thing. Would God punish a defiant attitude? Well, God does not punish anything. But when we have a defiant attitude towards God, then we can't have a relationship with God. It's like if I have a defiant attitude in my relationship with you in our, in our partnership, then obviously it's going to be very, very hard for us to have a very good relationship with each other. Mm -hmm. And so if my attitude is one of defiance, then that certainly will affect my relationship with God. Mm. But not from a punishment perspective, because God doesn't punish it. God just cannot have the relationship while we have the defiant attitude. And it's the same with a person on earth. You know, the person on earth who loves us wouldn't want to punish us for a defiant attitude we have towards them. But they wouldn't be able to maintain a relationship with us while we have one. Mm. Okay, uh, let's say someone originally thought garments were necessary for exaltation, but they now realise garments are just an artificial construct of priesthood spirits mm -hmm. who are not directly connected with God. Mm -hmm. Will that person be punished by God if they take them off? Will they be seen as someone who is untrustworthy or a covenant breaker? Well, um, this whole idea that a physical outward thing is a sign of a covenant is also flawed. So, for example, we see this a lot with marriage. You know, we, we put on a ring, which is a sign, an outward sign that we're now married. But, but the marriage actually occurs in the heart. And if the heart feeling breaks down, then the marriage is dissolved. Mm -hmm. Whether we have the outward symbol of it on our hand or not, the marriage is dissolved. So while I maintain a loving relationship and a desire for you, our marriage is established. As soon as I no longer have a loving relationship or desire for you, the marriage is dissolved. For many people, their marriage is established, dissolved, established, dissolved in the course of a day. <laughs> because of those particular attitudes from God's perspective. And of course, uh, this outward symbol is a reminder to the person that they're married. But really, it's of no benefit from God's perspective or the relationship with God. Now, the same applies to any garment. And in most religions, there are garments that are used in symbology. You know, in the Catholic faith, there is the nun wearing her garments, the priest wearing his robes. In the, you know, the, Muslim, the Muslim faith, there is the woman's garments, which are a mark of her religious and, and sexual purity. You know, there's all forms of garments that are used in all different religions. None of these garments prove the condition of a person's soul. They might be an expression of what the person desires to do, but they do not prove the condition of the soul. For the condition of the soul to be proven, real changes have to occur at the soul level. And that's the emotions and feelings and spiritual desires of the person. That's where the changes have to occur. So, so if I have a strong feeling that the garment is somehow valued or not valued by God, I am already in error. The garment is not valued by God. It's the spiritual garment, if you like, the feeling that we have that is in our soul that is valued by God. Mm -hmm. That is the actual garment that God sees, not the physical outward garment. God does not even see it. 
God does not even recognize it as a part of his relationship with you. Now, once you learn that truth, then you can see that the garment itself is not the thing that consecrates you. It's not the thing that validates your relationship. It's the heartfelt condition that validates the relationship. And that condition can be present without the garment when you're bathing, as much as it can be present with the garment when you go shopping. Mm -hmm. And the reality is the garment is not even a re reflection of the actual condition. There are many people who wear the garment of a condition, such as a priest, but who at the same time do something that is out of harmony with God's desires with regard to love. For instance, the priest who molests the child. Mm -hmm. You know, just because he's wearing the garment, it doesn't make him automatically a pure, consecrated being. It's his attitude in his heart that, turns, that turn, makes that. Now, if every religious faith understood that, we'd all be focused on changing our hearts instead of doing all of these outward rituals. Yes. And that would be a much better use of our energy mm. because we would actually then be establishing a true relationship with God rather than a fictional one. The problem with this kind of uh, teaching is that when a person passes into the spirit world, they believe that the garment somehow protected them when it did not. And so when they pass into the spirit world, they pass it often into a lot of confusion. They expect the results of the spirit world to be very different than what they actually are. And the reason why it is that way is because the heart was not changed. If the heart was changed, then the result is, is predictable. But if the heart is not changed, then the result is going to be predictable, but in a very negative sense, mm -hmm. we, we will change, we will we'll pass into a very darker condition. And this is why we'd like to talk to many of our Mormon spirit friends in the spirit world, uh, you know, when, once we have these discussions, because many of them have that feeling of confusion that while they are on earth, they practice the ritual, they practice the law of the faith, they practice this concept of remaining pure physically, sexually and otherwise, and yet when they pass, they often pass still in not the condition they expected. Yeah. And there's a huge amount of confusion that results from that. And, and it's only once you start understanding that everything comes from this condition of love, the actual feeling that's in the soul towards God and the feeling that's in the soul towards another person, that is actually the truth of your nature. And that's the thing that God sees. That's the garment that God sees. Once you understand that, then you can understand why those particular events occur. Mm -hmm. So in summary, to answer those questions would be that, um, obviously from what you're saying, God wouldn't punish a person who takes off their garment, no. nor would he see someone who takes them off as untrustworthy or a covenant breaker because you're saying no. it's a covenant in the heart. Exactly. Yeah. Every covenant that we make with any person, God or any other person, is in the heart. And many times we break the covenant in the heart mm -hmm. in the course of the day, yes. unfortunately. Yeah. But, but if we are truly, if we truly work through the underlying causal emotional reasons why we break covenants, in the end we won't break a covenant. And in fact, the covenant won't be the, be the thing. The desire within us will drive the relationship. So if I have a pure, passionate desire for God, then I'm in a permanent covenant with God. And, and I don't even feel it as a covenant. It's not a thing that might be broken and I might get punished for. Remember, God does not punish us for anything. So even when we do break a covenant, God's not there saying, now that you've broken this covenant, I'm going to do this to you. Mm -hmm. God is not that kind of God. God is much more loving than that. That might be what a human person does. You know, the average mar married person, when a husband or wife goes off with somebody else, gets very angry and upset and wants to cause the other person lots of damage, generally. Yeah. God does not do that. Yeah. God is better than the average person. Yeah. And, uh, and we need to keep remembering that with all of these, th these questions. Yeah. God is much better than what humanity has defined him. Yeah. Let's say that priesthood spirits actually protect people who wear garments. Mm -hmm. And that is a truth. Could you elaborate how that happens before I ask the question? Sure. Yeah, what, what happens is that many times, and we've talked about this before in the, in the Mormon the discussions we have about the Mormon religion, many times uh, uh, for almost all religious faiths, there are a group of spirits in the spirit world who want the next generation of practitioners of that faith on earth to follow the laws and principles that they themselves either constructed or followed. 
Now, what they do is they place protection around the person while the person follows those particular pr principles. So in other words, they try to protect the person against any negative spiritual influence that may occur. Other spirits who are negative in their nature that could attack the person are prevented from attacking the person by these stronger spirits because they, because they are a bit more loving than the other spirits who attack them. They are stronger and they are physically prevented. The darker spirits are physically prevented from attacking the person. In addition, the spirits themselves who want these particular teachings to be perpetuated on the planet are supporting the person and not attacking the person while the person stays in the condition of accepting the beliefs that these religious spirits still have. However, as soon as the person on earth decides to make a personal decision to not follow those particular teachings, these spirits in the spirit world often change in their behavior. They often now become attacking towards the person on the earth, and they often allow the person to be attacked by other spirits who they were previously preventing from attacking the person on earth. And they do this as a form of punishing the person on earth. Unfortunately, many of the people on earth then view that as punishment from God. God does not do such things. It is only people who are yet to be developed in love who do such things. And these are people who are unseen in the spirit world, who are manipulating people on earth, causing people on earth to either follow a practice, and, it, and then if they do not follow the practice, to punish them for, for not following the practice. And, and this causes people to believe that God is punishing them. God does no such things. In fact, God has a whole series of laws that cause a penalty on the soul of the person who does such a thing. Mm. So a person who punishes another due to some kind of religious righteous viewpoint is actually degrading their own condition of their soul and they'll end up in a darker place in the spirit world when they do this. Right, because that leads then to Caroline's questions. Mm -hmm. Is this a bad or evil thing to be a part of, these priesthood spirits that are protecting people wearing garments? Well, it's not a bad thing to protect anybody who, who, who you love. But the question you've got to ask yourself is, if you loved everybody, you'd be attempting to protect everybody. So is you wouldn't be selective <laughs> based on what they believe. Yes. So are these priesthood spirits sinning? Well, if, if, they are, if they are being um, unbalanced in their love, in other words, they are prejudicial in their love, they are willing to love only people who practice a certain thing, then yes, they are sinning mm. because they are not loving the other people. Mm. And from God's perspective, we need to love all of God's children because they are all our brothers and sisters. So it is a sin, it is a missing the mark of love if we love one person that like one person, you know, in one religious faith above a person of a different religious faith. We are actually sinning. Mm. We are actually doing something that's in disharmony with the principles of love. And clearly there would be an issue of sin if I say I was a person wearing a garment and I took it off and those spirits then attacked, me. attacked me, that would be sinning on their part also. Definitely. Yeah. That is a direct action to cause you physical harm, which is a violent act. Mm -hmm. And any time we're involved in a violent act, we are sinning. Mm -hmm. So yes. So now let's look at, say, I'm the person wearing the garment mm -hmm. and I'm involved uh, in this dynamic where there are priesthood spirits protecting me. Am I sinning by being involved in that? Well, as I said, there is no harm in you being protected. But if you take off your garments and you're no longer protected, that is an indication of the poor condition of the people who are trying to protect you. Mm -hmm. Because the reality is if they were perfectly developed, they'd want to protect every person, right? not mm -hmm. just you. Yeah. And they'd want to protect you whether you wore the garment or not. Mm -hmm. right? And if they're only protecting you when you wear the garment and they are attacking you when you do not, they are manipulating you through fear. They are trying to use violence to manipulate your life. Mm -hmm. That is a very unloving act. And so what I would do if it was me under those circumstances, I would, I would talk to those spirits and talk to them about their unloving actions. But am I sinning? There's no harm in being protected, but if, you only, if, if, they're, if you're only being protected when you're wearing the garment and you're aware of that, then I would start 
looking at my own investment in fear by not by choosing to not wear the garment mm. and seeing how the spirits around me react then. Mm. Now, if the spirits react in exactly the same manner as they reacted when I wore the garment, then this is evidence that they are spirits who are developed in love. Mm -hmm. If the spirits around me react completely differently and a lot of my life goes into turmoil and trouble as soon as I do not wear the garment, this is an indication that the spirits around me are quite dark in their condition and have a tendency towards violence. And I would start working my way through my acceptance of my relationship with them under those circumstances. Sure. What advice would you give to a Mormon who feels that, you, that what you are saying about the temple is true and sees the logic of it, but feels unprotected and sinful when they attempt to take off their garments? Well, the reality is for many, unless, unless the Mormon faith changes in the spirit world, and by that what I mean is unless, there, unless the spirits involved in the Mormon faith in the spirit world release their desire for the physical uh, garment to be a sort of protective stance, unless they change some of their belief systems in the spirit world, they will attack a person generally on earth and try to force them back into submission. We need to on earth understand that whenever we submit to the violent act of another, we are in fact enabling the violent act of another. So we need to come to understand that whenever we submit to the demands and expectations of another person who is acting in a manner that's out of harmony with love, we need to have the courage to break through that process of submission and learn to stand on our own two feet without support. Now, in that place, obviously, God supports us. But there might be many spirit attacks that we receive as a result of not being supported by the spirits themselves. What we need to understand is that until we break this addiction that we have to be kept safe by other people and only reflect upon keeping safe in our relationship with God, we will have a tendency to break our integrity under certain attacks. Mm -hmm. We need to stop doing that if we are truly going to have a good relationship with God. In other words, we need to have the courage under all forms of attack to remain steadfast to the principles of love. So my suggestion in this particular example is that the Mormon spirits in the spirit world change their viewpoint with regard to the garments and change their viewpoint with regard to many of the rituals that they require the Mormon faith on earth to continue. And by the way, I feel it's the same for the Catholic faith and the same for the Muslim faith and the same for all the other faiths. Mm -hmm. They need, the spirits in the spirit world do need to change what they believe to be the truth about the rituals of those particular faiths. We need to all get to the point where we see that love is the underlying core tenet of all relationship with each other and with God. Once we understand that, we will give up trying to punish people when they do not do what we believe they should do. So this is very important that people in the spirit world give up the tendency to punish people on earth when the people on earth do not do what the spirits want. Mm -hmm. Once the spirits do that, it's going to be very much easier for the people on earth to feel their true condition and to do things because they really want to, which is what God wants us to do. God wants us to only do things because we really desire it. God does not want us to do things because we are afraid if we do not do them that we'll be punished. God does not do the punishing. It is only wicked people on earth and wicked people in the spirit world who do the punishing. Or people who misunderstand the principles of you know, what is holiness and what is truth that do this punishing. They have a self-righteous attitude towards people on earth and they feel they can punish people on earth for not doing what they believe to be the right thing. This is something that all of humanity has to give up. We have no right to punish any person for anything unless, it was some, unless there was a feeling inside of the person that was out of harmony with the principles of love. And even then, it's not a process of punishing the person. It's a process of trying to rehabilitate the person, mm -hmm. which is not an angry process, and it's not a process that is violent towards the person. So even if there was a murderer who murders on earth, we would not angrily punish the murderer. We would attempt to help the murderer go through a process of rehabilitation 
and find the actual emotional reason that caused them to desire murder. Mm-hmm. And, and we, that, might take, might, that might take 80 years. It might not take 20 years that we jail them for, right? Mm-hmm. It might take 10 years, it might take five years. It just depends on the person and their willingness to go through the process. And if they're not willing to go through the process, then we need to restrict their access to society until they go through the process. That's all we would do. We would not take actions of violence against them. And this is something that all of humanity and all of the spirits in the spirit world need to give up, this, this action of taking violence against another person because of some kind of self-righteous stance. So in this situation where someone feels... Um very unprotected and sinful when they take off their garments. You're saying it's an issue of confronting the fear, that's why they're feeling unprotected, because there's a fear within them, a desire to be protected by someone other than God. Yes. And what about this feeling of being sinful? Well, that Is also that... often comes from the spirits who, who are surrounding them. The spirits often project a, a concept at the person and plant thoughts into their mind that they're now, you know, because they have a feeling of guilt, they plant thoughts into their mind that are open to these, guilt opens them to these thoughts, that they are doing something wrong, that they're doing something sinful. Now, as I've mentioned already, Mm -hmm. many times in the discussion about the Mormon faith, but also remember that these same principles apply to almost every faith on the planet. Any garment is not a symbol of what's in the heart. Mm -hmm. And God sees what's in the heart, Mm -hmm. not, not what's the outward appearance. So, so while we believe that God sees the outward appearance, we are already having a misconception of God. God sees only what is in the heart, and God measures us by what is in our heart. And in fact, all of God's laws measure us automatically by what's in our heart. Mm. In fact, what we attract in our life is measured by what's in our heart. So everything that's happening is a direct reflection of what's in our heart. And once we understand that concept, we, are, we become less addicted two belief systems that are surrounding rituals. Yeah, yeah that's clear. Thank mm. you. Uh, would you like to continue? We've got quite a bit. To... Is there some more to go? Perhaps we need yeah. to have a break? Have a little break, yeah. 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 That'll be good. Okay, let's do that. Let's...